begin by introducing my colleague, uh, Francisco Pinto. He's a weekend uh, news anchor and also reporter at Channel 34 Univision, who will be helping us today, today as a panelist. Francisco, bienvenido. Thank you, Rolando. Thank you to Loyola Marymount University for allowing us, uh, giving us this opportunity for tonight's event. And um, let's get started. I was um, ready to introduce other panelists, but Gabriel Lerner from Periodical Opinion, you might see him walk in at any, at any moment now. Um, he works for La Opinion. He's the other journalist also that was going to be the, that is the panelist for tonight's event. Let me talk a little bit about the rules uh, of tonight's um, uh, event. Each candidate will have one minute of opening remarks. The panelists will then direct questions to each candidate, at which time they will have one minute to respond. I'll also request a rebuttal from one um, of you from time to time. And toward the end of the program, we'll ask students from the audience to ask questions of the candidates. We will have about five, 10 to 15 minutes um, to get those questions from all the students. And as you can, you can see, uh, there's a microphone on this side over here where the students will have a chance to ask your questions. Before we close, each candidate will have one minute for closing remarks. We're ready? ready We're ready. Let me, uh, let me begin with uh, Francisco Pinto. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I take that back. Let me begin with Mr. Parks, and we'll do it in alphabetical orders uh, with your uh, one minute opening uh, remarks. Mr. Parks. Thank you very much, and thanks, everybody, for being here. When I saw Father come up here, uh, having uh, been in Catholic school for 12 years, and at that time we called it 12 years and no parole, uh, uh, I was a little concerned. I didn't know whether to bend over his swats or take the bubble gum off my forehead. So, uh, But it is uh, good to be here. Uh, my sister's a graduate of this uh, university, and it's a, a treasure in our community. I'm uh, running for mayor. One of many reasons is for uh, just you, the young people in this community. One of the things I think is so important as we see what's going on in the city, there's so many things that uh, are different than when I grew up. Uh, when I was growing up, you had every dream that you could actually accomplish almost anything you wanted to in Los Angeles. You had a dream of own, owning a home. You could have done anything. Today, those dreams are diminishing. Uh, the middle class is moving out of the community. We're at the lowest level of literacy in our community. People your age, the students, uh, the likelihood of you owning a home in the city of Los Angeles is diminishing and may be almost impossible. If we do not change the direction of this city as it relates to our infrastructure, our housing, our transportation, our public service, we will find that many of us will not want to be a resident in the city of LA. We must change that direction March 8th. And for those who are new voters, uh, I think it's important to realize it's a process. It's not an end result and that you should make that commitment to vote each and every time you have that opportunity. Is somebody keeping time or? or we are, we are, you're sir. Here? You're here? Okay. It's time now. Okay. Thank you. Council member. Council member Villarregos. Primero quiero dar las gracias a Canal 34 y a La Opinión, a la Universidad de Loyola. I want to thank KMEX 34, La Opinión, and Loyola University for sponsoring this debate. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. Some of you had to come because you uh, had a class assignment, but others are here because uh, and all of you care about the city, and I want to thank you for that because in many ways, uh, this election is an opportunity for us to have a conversation, a, a conversation about what kind of city we want to live in, a conversation about what we're looking for in our leaders, but very importantly, a conversation about what all of us are ready to do uh, to make this a better city and, uh, and, a, and our neighborhoods better. Uh, I said to many people over the years that I'm blessed by the opportunity that is America in Los Angeles. I'm here today because there was a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act I'm here today because I had a woman, a mother of indomitable spirit who believed in her son, and a teacher who had high expectations, a public school system that gave me a second chance. I think the responsibility of a leader in a great city like Los Angeles is to ensure that more people have a second chance, that we live in a city where we're growing and prospering together. That's why I'm running for mayor, and I'd be honored to have your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Villarrosa. As I said earlier, Mr. Gabriel Lerner from Proyecto La Opinión is our panelist. Welcome, Gabriel. Thank you very much. We'll begin with Francisco. 
Uh, the first question will be to um, Councilman Parks, Francisco. Thank you, Rolando. Uh, Councilman Parks, we have uh, two white candidates, two Latinos and an African-American. Will race play a role in people's decision and how? I think, first of all, race plays a decision in every decision people make. I mean, most people that are black and brown, people can't avoid knowing they're black and brown. And whatever there may be their internal biases uh, will uh, uh, come out sometime. I would hope that in this city that is a city of minorities, not majorities, but a city of minorities, that people are striving each and every day to get over bias. But again, I think we'll see campaign ads that will try to separate our communities as it was before. And we have to avoid that. We have to be able to distinguish when people are using bias as a way to uh, cobble enough votes for election, but not enough support to administer the city. So it's up to us to turn our back on those people that will use bias to separate us, because we cannot, as a city, function without coalitions and our ability to work together, because our strength is our diversity. Our strength is the languages, the culture that are in our, is in our community. And so it's us, it depends on our shoulders to reject anybody that chooses to use race or bias in any campaign. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Mr. Villarregosa. I hope not. I hope it doesn't play a role in this race. Uh, I do believe that uh, the, the strength of this city is the diversity of it. And when you look around uh, this room, you see uh, that diversity. Uh, look, this is the great city on the hill. It's a city where we come from every corner of the earth. The one thing in this city, the most diverse anywhere in the world, is that we should accept the idea that we should be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin or our accent or our gender or, or our orientation. Uh, my hope is that we'll talk about issues, and I think that the vast majority of people in this city are looking for a uniter, someone that embraces this diversity, someone that believes that this diversity is our strength. And so uh, while there are some people that would try to inflame and create fear, I think most of us want to know what you're going to do, uh, what your plan is, what your vision is, what your track record is. Uh, that's, I, I think, what's important in this race. Thank you, Councilman Villarregosa. <laughs> Gabriel Lerner from La Opinión, and this question is for Councilman Villarregosa. Yes, uh, Concejal. Uh, first, let me apologize for being late. I'm not going to ask the question about them freeways. <laughs> um, <laughs> You propose to hire 3,000 more uh, police officers without raising taxes. Now the question is, do we really need only more police uh, officers in the streets or do we need uh, preventive programs or do we need to reform LAPD as a whole? Uh, actually, Gabriel, that's Bob Hertzberg that proposed the 3,000 officers. I proposed uh, another 1,000 officers. I authored uh, a measure uh, just uh, two weeks ago with Greg Smith, supported by the entire council, uh, to put 265 more police officers on our streets. We're the most under-policed big city in the United States of America, make no mistake about it. I have a plan to put another 1,000 officers, but that plan includes prevention and intervention. Take a look at me, everyone. Uh, if you look at my life, it's a life of uh, bumps along the road. Uh, I say to people that I'm here today uh, because in the 1960s, we had a safety net for young people. We had a teen post. We had a neighborhood youth corps. We had uh, the CETA program, uh, after school programs that were very different than what we have today. Uh, I think it's essential uh, that we support after school programs and prevention and intervention programs. We can save young people we, if we invest in them. And so uh, as important as police are, and I'm supportive of putting uh, at least 1,000 more police officers on our streets, Prevention and intervention programs are just as important. That's why I proposed a, and had last year an earn and learn program, which we'll talk to you about later on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Parks. You know, I think, first of all, uh, when we talk about police officers, what we have to get away from is the politicization of the police department. Every four years, just for election, everybody wants to add police officers, and then it diminishes real quick right after that. Uh, it's almost impossible to hire 1,000 officers in one year or 3,000 in one year because the officers uh, leave at about 300 per year, so you have to keep even by hiring 300. What I believe we have to do is put a measured growth of uh, over a 10-year period and add officers from our general fund. It is not something that you'd add a half-cent sales tax or look for a bond. 
the general fund, the $5 billion that you pay as taxes and fees should be the, the resource and the funding for officers for the city. It's the most basic thing that we provide, and that is uh, public safety. And, and we also need to look at the uh, prevention, intervention, education, because that's the way that we keep young people out of the criminal justice system. 60% of those in state prison are illiterate, and so that gives you a clear indication of why education is so important. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Next question from, from Francisco Pinto to Councilman Parks. Mr. Parks, a recent verdict gave uh, $2.4 million to a couple of Inglewood police officers after beating up a young African-American. A recent police shooting killed a 13-year-old African-American. Police brutality, an officer-involved shootings, how would you approach it differently as a mayor compared as how you did it as a chief of police? I would do it the same way I did as chief of police. I cut shootings in half as a chief of police. They average about 100 per year before I became chief and I cut them to about 48 per year. The way you cut shootings is to ensure that officers understand that there's consequences. Officers have the ability by law to take the two most precious things you have, and that's your liberty and your life. They have to have additional scrutiny. I, as a police chief, fired 130 officers who did not do their job well and abused the community. They must know that they're going to be held accountable. They must know they're going to get proper training. They must know they're going to get the support when they deserve it. But the only way that we can ensure that these incidents that we see before us are kept to a minimum is for officers to have a standard of conduct, so that there's a risk management program to evaluate them throughout their career. And you also have to make sure there's a discipline system and a training system that corrects behavior and remove those who might be uh, negative influence in the department and might be abusive to the community. That's how you stop police uh, abuse. And also you have to have an open complaint system to ensure that people in this community can make a complaint and not be uh, negotiated out by police officers. Thank you, Councilman Parks. At this point, we would like to welcome Senator Richard Alarcón. Welcome, sir. Bienvenido. <laughs> Mr. Alarcón, you do have one minute for your opening remarks. <laughs> okay, I guess we have to... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I were mayor, I'd get rid of the tape. In this case, black. What a, ple a pleasure to be here at Loyola Marymount. This is a tremendous institution and an opportunity for students to engage in an election to cause real change in Los Angeles. I'm running for mayor because this city needs to change. It needs to move away from the powerful moneyed interests that are controlling the decision-making process at City Hall. Developers and contractors who are making huge contributions and then changing the decision-making, expecting political favors in return. That's why I'm running for mayor, and that's what we need to do. I want to empower the neighborhoods to have more control of and say so about what their neighborhood is going to look like and how they participate in their community. We can do these things, but only if we change the mayor and if we change the way City Hall operates. That's why I've introduced a ballot measure to eliminate contractor and developer contributions. That's why I support giving neighborhood councils real planning authority. That's why I'm suing the city of Los Angeles for raising the water rates. We need to change this city. We can't leave it the same. Thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, Mr. Alarcón. Obviously, with uh, all the delays, uh, the format has changed a little bit. So, Mr. Alarcón, let me, let me go back to you and, and pose a question that was asked earlier about, by one of my colleagues. And um, that was asked to uh, Mr. Parks and Mr. Villarraigosa to give you a chance to answer that. The question was, we have two white candidates, two Latinos and an African-American. Will race play a role in people's decision and how? I hope not. I hope not. I hope they vote for the person that they believe is going to create the real change that they need, give them the power that they need to take control of city government. Um, I, in my first run for city council, I ran against two white people, an African American and a Latino. There were <laughs> it's the same combination as we have today. Uh, and, and we had the opportunity to to create real change then, and we have the opportunity to create real change now. People should not consider race alone. I worked for Mayor Bradley for six years, and if there's one thing he taught me, it was that no mayor of Los Angeles could represent only their ethnicity. That's why he was in office for 20 years. He represented all of this diverse city. In fact, diversity is our strength. So whoever the next mayor is, they have to embrace the entire community, 
And that is uh, something that is absolutely essential. I hope the voters make a decision on, on the basis of who they believe is going to end the, the potential, uh, the alleged corruption at City Hall, uh, end the uh, pay to play uh, dynamics that occur, and move this city forward with real community empowerment. Thank you, Mr. Alarcon. Real learner, and the question is to Mr. Villarregoso. Yes, um, I would like to, to make this question to all the candidates, but um, because I think it's uh, of crucial importance. And it's the fact that Los Angeles is the national capital of homelessness in this country. Uh, we have around 100,000 homeless in the streets of Los Angeles and the county every day. Now, 20, 25% of them are women, 30% of them are, are Latino, and we have 10,000 children that are homeless. Uh, now, the budget of the uh, Los Angeles Authority for Homeless Services uh, is around $50 million, while the budget for uh, New York City homeless is uh, around $640 million. So my question is, as mayor, will you commit to putting additional dollars for the homeless, and your approach is to hide them or to solve their problems? You know, Gabriel, you hit it right on the head. In fact, when I open up on the issue of homelessness, I always say, if you want to do something about the homelessness in Los Angeles, you can't just talk about it. You can't just have a blue ribbon commission that meets about it. You've got to commit yourself to a dedicated funding stream to address it. Uh, that means a funding stream for mental health, that means a funding stream for housing with families getting the first priority. That means a funding stream for the drug rehab that's so critical and important in that community. A funding stream for the job skills and training that we need to move people out of homelessness. I am committed to addressing the issue of homelessness and, ex and increasing the funding stream to address that issue. Mr. Parks. Having been a police officer for 38 years, we've seen the homelessness population grow. And I think the problem we have is calling it homelessness, is that it's a symptom of about four problems. It's the mentally ill population. It's the population that's uh, unemployable, or, uh, unemployable or unemployed. It's the uh, individuals that have an addiction problem. It's a, a group of convicts that may return to the community and hide amongst the homeless. And then we have the final group that actually preys on those other four. When we want to solve the problem, we need to zero in on the issue of mental illness and provide care. We should not allow the LA County Jail to be the largest mental health hospital in the county. We should make sure that there are services there. We have to have services for uh, addiction. We have to deal with education. We have to get rid of illiteracy. If we gave every homeless person a home, unfortunately, we would not solve many of their problems. We have to get to the core problems and to solve it and not deal with the symptoms of calling it homelessness and be uh, fearful of dealing with the most critical problems are those four populations I mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Parks. This issue of homelessness actually take us to the next point, which is housing. And this question is for Mr. Alarcón, Francisco Pinto. Senator Alarcón. Do you get to answer that one? You, you should do, but um, it, it's, it's very correlated. So why don't we, why don't we let him uh, ask this question? It, it goes along those lines. Uh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Housing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Housing, or the lack of, is a serious issue not only for low-income families anymore, but also for the middle class. What is your approach? What, is, what approach is best in order to meet the needs of thousands of Angelinos and their dream of uh, owning a house? Well, first of all, I don't think they're the same issue. Homelessness and the housing shortage is, are two distinct issues uh, related, but, but uh, one is a very severe issue of homelessness and the other is, is uh, the more common issue of the lack of affordable housing and the low home ownership rate, arguably at about 40% in the city of Los Angeles. This is not the Los Angeles that I grew up in, where the home ownership rates were between 60 and 70%. We need to build an economy that allows people to get jobs. So we need to raise the skill level of our workforce to attract businesses to hire people at better wages with better benefits so that they can afford to own a house. 
as mayor, I want to negotiate with the banks to find new financing mechanisms because a lot of people are still keeping their money in their mattresses, believe it or not. We need to get them into the financial institutions, but we need those financial institutions to be to recognize that that paying rent for 10 years straight without missing a payment is a form of credit that should be recognized. We need to provide down payment assistance. As a council member, I created a down payment assistance program for police officers. As a senator, I created a down payment assistance program for home for teachers. Uh, we did that because we need to empower them to pay down payments. When you have a $500,000 home, you have to come up with $100,000. So we need to crea be creative about how we provide down payment assistance to teachers and other working class folks in our society. Thank you, Mr. Alarcon. <laughs> Councilman Parks, how do we solve this issue of lack of housing for middle income or low income families? I think we have to solve it across the board. Uh, we cannot keep quoting figures that we have an increase in housing when we know that we have a uh, net decrease each year of at least 1,000 units. We also have to look at the industry. What do they tell us is the reason they choose not to build in Los Angeles, but they're building significantly in the Inland Empire and in San Diego County and Ventura? We have to also realize that we can create a option for uh, people that live in apartments by tweaking our ordinance for conversion of apartments to condominiums. You can immediately protect tenants who cannot afford uh, the, the down payment or the closing costs, but pay a rental each month that you can convert that and begin to increase the amount of home ownership. The other issue is that in, in a, uh, dealing with home ownership, we have to get back to our planning effort to make sure that certain parts of our city are not a dumping ground for senior housing and affordable and other parts of the community have none of those. It has to be something that's spread throughout the city and to where every community can give a signal that you can have every level of housing and, and, uh, in any part of the city. Gabriel Lerner. Yes, uh, this will be a question on the, on the uh, to uh, Chief, to uh, <laughs> Councilman Parks. On the same issue of housing, we talk about inclusionary zoning, which is a, a lower policy that uh, will force developers to build some units um, that will be available for people of uh, lower income. And I understand that you prefer an approach of market value building in, in your district, uh, and that your claim is that there is enough affordable housing in your district. I don't think there's enough, but we've only had affordable and senior housing built in the 8th district for the last 15 to 20 years. The first market rate development that was approved was uh, two months ago for the district in 15 to 20 years. I think that's an imbalance. That sends a message to people that are middle class or above, there's no place to live in the 8th district. I think that when we deal with inclusionary uh, zoning, we have to be able to understand that if developers won't build under those conditions, they'll build elsewhere. I think the way that you get inclusionary zoning is to have incentives so developers see the benefit. I have a project on 94th and Broadway that would be a market rate housing development that the city is going to use its own land to leverage a developer to build townhomes for market rate. But there's an option in there that they can have inclusionary at different prices, prices if they choose to use the city's land. So that's the way you incentivize people to do what you need in your community. You get home ownership, you get inclusionary zoning, and it's done on a voluntary basis. And the other issue in the, z in the zoning ordinances in the city, the two opt-out clauses are not acceptable for poor communities. Thank you, Mr. Park. Uh, Mr. Villarregosa, this question is directly, directly from a group of people that I met last Saturday morning at an event that we had at Univision. And uh, some of your constituents um, still upset about the fact that you're running for mayor and that you broke a campaign promise by not fulfilling your four years as city council. They also told me, they're accusing you that you already took up papers to run for Senate. Is it true and what do you have to say to them? Circumstances has changed. Look, when I ran for city council a year and a half ago, I truly believed that I was gonna be a council member for four years. I worked hard uh, in the 14th Councilmanic District, brought 6,000 people in our days of service, uh, put together, organized 80 neighborhood watches, engaged this community. But it became crystal clear, beginning with the MTA strike, that this mayor was missing in action, that this mayor has uh, had a, an administration that's the most investigated uh, in my lifetime, since the 1930s. An administration uh, mired in scandal. And so I decided to run. 
when I did, I sought counsel of my constituents and people throughout the city, but most importantly, I sought counsel of my family and decided to do that. With respect to the Senate uh, uh, account that you're talking about, it's a Senate account I've had for some four or five years. Next question is for uh, Mr. Alarcón. Francisco Pinto. Mr. Alarcón, uh, racial tension between Latinos and African Americans is a current reality in Los Angeles for uh, decades. Um, how are you planning to find common ground between these two groups? The same way I did as a councilman for the city of Los Angeles. I represent uh, a, a broad, uh, very diverse community. Uh, about 8% of uh, my uh, council district uh, was uh, African American. Uh, it includes Pacoima, a lot of neighborhoods that have transitioned over the years. Uh, I know about the tension between Latinos and African Americans because I've had to ameliorate many of the uh, ramifications. Right? Hubert Humphrey Park, there was a shooting, uh, a gang-related shooting that crossed over uh, ethnic boundaries. The bottom line is we all want the same things. Uh, I tell neighbors in Pacoima uh, that they have more in common with their neighbor no matter where they come from, what ethnic group they are, what language they speak, than they do with somebody who lives far across town. We have to work together. Uh, when I worked for Mayor Bradley, he demonstrated that we could pull communities together in common interests with the interests of, of the city of Los Angeles, but at the same time, working together. This is the most diverse city on earth. That's why, as a senator, I called to establish the, uh, a diversity institute at the University of California, and we're working to develop that. Well, Los Angeles is that experiment. There is tension between uh, communities, not just Latino and African American, uh, Latino and Armenian at uh, Grand High School, Thank an you, issue Mr. we had to move in. I'm, I apologize, I, I didn't see the card. Thank you. Um, so we, can all, we all have to work together, it's clear. I've done it in, in, as a council member as well as a, as a senator. Mr. Parks. I think that it's clear that as our communities evolve, uh, having grown up in the city of Los Angeles, when blacks were able to move west uh, into Lamert Park and a variety of communities, the same tension was there. We have the same tension as it relates to uh, minority communities where Korean businesses now take over businesses that used to be owned by blacks or uh, whites. I think the issue is how we get people together to understand that they are in this together, that they are in a changing and evolving society, and that they are also a part of a larger picture. Uh, the more that people understand that the city of LA is a not a melting pot, but a place where there are no minorities and everyone has the distinct ability to c maintain their heritage and their culture, but also understand that their coalitions are very important for success. That's when we begin to make progress. I found some tension at Crenshaw High School. The way we dealt with it, I brought Antonio out to see me and talk to these young people and say, Hispanics and black can get along, talk to them about their future, talk to them about why they need to learn to get together. That's how you get it done on a first hand and upfront a basis of addressing it, uh, those problems head on. Thank you, Mr. Parks. <laughs> Next question is for Antonio Villarregosa, Gabriel Lerner. Yes, the question is about uh, jobs, good jobs. Uh, the city gained in the last years 40,000 uh, jobs, but uh, not of the, the, the better type of. So, oh, thank you. So, uh, my question is, why in the cities that are adjacent to, to Los Angeles, the increase in, uh, in the um, growth of jobs was 75% more, and as mayor, what do you plan to do about that? One of the most important responsibilities of the next mayor is going to be to address the economic vitality of the city and to create good, high-wage, middle-class jobs. Uh, just two days ago, with Gloria Molina, I announced a historic joint partnership with the city and the county to create a biomed research park triangle around LA County, USA, C, that will one day bring 8,500 uh, middle class, high wage jobs in biotech and biomed. We have a U UCLA, an SC, and a Caltech that can be an engine for economic development. We can draw down the $3 billion in stem cell research uh, monies 
to create that industry and develop that industry. We have a $4 billion asset in the DWP. Instead of using that asset for my own private public relations in the way that Jim Hahn has, what you're going to see is a mayor who's going to use that asset to create new industries, solar in industry, uh, the wind technology industry, the, in the waste to energy, bio which is called biomass. We need to focus on creating good jobs in this city. We've got trade and tourism, the largest port, third largest port in the world, the fifth busiest airport, the most diverse population in the world. The next mayor has got to look east and south to create markets uh, and take advantage of this diversity and the infrastructure that we have and I'll do that as mayor. Thank you, Mr. Villarragosa. Before we open up the floor for questions uh, from the audience, let me ask Mr. Parks one more question. The criti criticism of alleged corruption in City Hall is generalized as grand juries investigate. But you've been in the City Council also running the city. Were any of you council members aware at one point or another of what was happening in regards to the pay-to-play scandal, and do you feel any responsibility of it? Well, I don't feel responsibility because I did not pay to play. But I think that in October of last year, uh, a motion was put uh, by myself before City Council to talk about not having uh, commissioners uh, raise funds, having a code of ethics for commissioners. The issue on this pay-to-play is that money is not inherently dirty. It's when you make a deal and say, if you give me this, I will do that. That's when it becomes pay to play. So what we need to realize is that uh, we cannot legislate honesty and integrity. People that are brought in the city government are either honest or they're not. They will use the system. What we have to have is rules that protect the community uh, from their mis anyone misusing their public funds. But there is a responsibility if people know about it and choose not to deal with it. The environment created in the city has been created by one administration. The only people who have gained from that in corruption has been one administration. Unlike corruption in the past where people may do it for their own personal interest, every single count of corruption has benefited the current uh, administration and no one else. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Lando, Lando, uh, would you allow me to just ask one more question to Mr. Alarcon, please? Uh, I think it's, to me, it's a really important issue, Mr. Alarcon, uh, and it has to do with teachers' salaries. And I would have loved for Mr. Herzberg to be here to answer that question. Um, teacher salaries, I understand it's out of the mayor's hand, but so is the division of the school system. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to do anything about it? Do you think, is, are they fairly compensated? Uh, I think uh, teachers should be compensated more than prison guards, that's for sure. And that's why I introduced a bill to provide $200 million. <laughs> that applause was on Antonio's time, okay? <laughs> but thank you anyway, Antonio. <laughs> I'll do the same. But that, <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished, Antonio. That's why I introduced uh, uh, a Senate bill to provide $200 million to upgrade the teachers, particularly in LAUSD. This bill required that teachers be in a pre-internship or internship program to get their full credential. At the time I introduced the bill, we had 24% of our teachers in LA Unified without a full credential. Uh, now, only 10% don't have a full credential, but every single one of them has to be in an internship or pre-internship program. We also provided about $80 million to increase their, their compensation, including down payment assistance for home ownership, et cetera. So the answer, for, with regard to Mr. Hertzberg and the breakup of the school district, uh, the question is, how do we get more dollars into the classroom? And the mayor doesn't have direct authority to, to break up the district, but he can have responsibility to build schools faster by moving the planning department, moving building and safety, moving the departments that, that participate in the development of these schools and get them built as quickly as possible. That's the best thing the mayor should do, and I would like to see the candidates focus on what the mayor can do, not what, uh, what uh, the school district has to do, because they can point the finger back at us and say we're hurting the school system just as easy as somebody pointing the finger at them. Thank you, Mr. Alarcon. Let me ask the students. I, I do believe that the students have a, if, the, if you have your questions, if you can please pass along this, uh, those cards with all the questions so that way we can uh, ask the candidates. But in the meantime, let me ask Mr. Villarraigosa. Um, this is from the audience, Mr. Villarraigosa. 
And it talks about a recent article in Los Angeles Times cited the arts as one of the leading factors in the recent increase in tourism, uh, tourism in Los Angeles. The area's second largest industry, which generates some 12 billion annually in the local economy and employs 256,000 LA, LA County residents. Our two biggest and state competitors for tourist dollars, San Francisco and San Diego, spend $15 and $8 per capita, respectively, on public funding for the arts, while Los Angeles spends less than $1 per year per person. As mayor, would you commit to putting additional dollars behind the arts, thereby growing the entire economy of the region? Yes. And let me tell you what I did as a council member when uh, Mayor Hahn tried to decimate the, the already depleted funds in the Cultural Affairs, Affairs Department. I stood up, uh, was the first council member to say no. He tried to cut $2.7 million. Uh, the council restored about 700 of it. Uh, I restored 1.7, about, I'm sorry, about 900 of it. I supported uh, and proposed another 1.7 so that we didn't cut cultural affairs. I think cultural tourism is important. But you know what, folks? I support the arts for the arts. The arts is a great unifier. It's, it's it, in a city that's as diverse as Los Angeles, it's the one, you know, uh, uniter of the, of the cultures and the like. And so I believe that we need to promote the arts. Uh, I want to support public projects that have an art component. Uh, I believe that it's critical when we deal with anti-graffiti programs that we have an art component to that as well. I want to give people an opportunity to express themselves, to lift the human spirit. I think that's what the arts is all about. Thank you, Mr. Villarregosa. Uh, Mr. Parks, this is from um, one of the students, Luis Elias. Uh, you recently voted against a tax hike that is greatly in need for public safety in the city of Los Angeles that will put 1,200 new police officers in our streets, even though the difference in sales tax is only going to rise half a percent, and the chief of police approved it. What are your reasons for your actions? I have about 12 uh, reasons why. One, we've asked the public seven times, and they said no. I don't think we go the eighth time. The other is we have a police department, in my judgment, is working part-time. They're working a three-day work week. Uh, you go to school five days, I work five days, criminals work seven days, police officers work three days. I don't think that's fair. When we had $80 million available in city funds, the, uh, over a 14 to 1 vote, the council and the mayor gave an $80 million pay raise to the police, which could have purchased 800 police officers if we really thought that was a priority. These are the kind of things I think is equally important to have more police officers, but what's equally important is how you deploy them. And I think until the police department comes to grips with a three-day work week and put officers back to work, they can't really cr cr uh, credibly come to the public and say, give me more money. I think also what I've seen in the public, they're not willing to pay for personnel costs through a budget, uh, through a uh, initiative. They will build buildings, they'll build infrastructure, but they will not pay for personnel costs. Thank you, Mr. Parks. <laughs> Mr. Alarcon, this question is from uh, Matt Sherwood. What do you see as Los Angeles' biggest infrastructure problem, and what is the first step that you will take to fix it? Well, the first, uh, oh, there's so many infrastructural problems, but I worry about the human infrastructure. I worry about how people are relating to each other. I worry about their feelings about the community, and I worry that we are not giving them the power to control their neighborhoods. That's why I want to encourage uh, and create opportunities for neighborhood councils to have real planning authority. But in terms of the infrastructure, the hardcore infrastructure, transportation uh, is, is crit a critical issue. We do not have enough money. And while we can promise that we're going to do this project and that project, the issue is consensus building to fight to get the dollars. The LAX project is a project that, that is, is most sad because we have not used the opportunity to build consensus. The two Congress members who uh, serve that area do not support the project. Five County Board of Supervisors members all uh, oppose the project. That is not how you go to the federal government and ask for billions of dollars in support. You've got to build consensus. I just think that we can use the neighborhood council system and the other systems to start beginning the process of agreeing in our community and then going forward to Sacramento and the federal government to get the dollars that we need to truly build out our infrastructure. Thank you, Senator. This question is uh, basically for all three of you, and I will begin with Mr. Parks from Aram uh, Nigerian. The question is, what is your position on the recent Real ID Act and the overall issue of giving illegal immigrants driver's license? 
I supported, I, I think, SB60, SB60A, and, and whatever the last one was. As a police chief, I think it's uh, important to realize it is a safety factor. Uh, it's also a factor that's important to realize that uh, in dealing with driver's license, that we know who the person is. You get positive ID. You also uh, allow a person to get insurance, which helps all of us, and that individuals know the driving rules to get a driver's license. And I think the issue as far as providing uh, that uh, driver's license is not a hazard to the community, as people have said. So I think it's a great benefit to have positive ID. We believe in the city of Los Angeles, 80% of the hit and run misdemeanors are caused by unlicensed drivers. And so that gives us some indication of why it's important that we license people, that they understand the rules of the road. But what's most important for all of us is to know who's in our community, which we would not have if we did not have that positive identification through a system of, of driver's license. So those are my three reasons why I've supported it for about the last six years. Thank you, Mr. Parks. <laughs> Mr. Villarregosa. I oppose the Real ID Act as a threat to the civil liberties of all Americans. I think the best way to defend our national security is to promote our civil rights and our civil liberties. I support uh, driver's licenses. In fact, I was Speaker of the Assembly the first time uh, the first bill by Gilbert Cedillo passed the legislature. I also support the matricula consular because I think it's absolutely essential that people be able to come out in the open and have a basic ID. Look, folks. It's easy to demonize uh, the immigrants. It's easy to de demonize uh, those who come here to work for their families. I think we need a mayor that's going to embrace our diversity. I think that we need a mayor that's going to stand up and ask the federal government for the appropriate uh, compensation to cities and counties and states for the cost of illegal immigration. But we And a mayor that's going to say that every country has a right to enforce our immigration laws. But we need to do it smart and effective and not scapegoat children, deny them health care or education. Me too. Uh, I agree with uh, both my colleagues on this score. I agree with uh, uh, the mayor on this score. I agree with uh, uh, Bob Hertzberg on this score. We all agree on uh, these two critical issues or three issues. Uh, but I want to tell you why I supported uh, the driver's license bill and voted for it seven times. I even voted against rescinding the measure when my Democratic colleagues voted for it. Um, my son was killed in a car accident by an uninsured motorist. Uh, that uninsured motorist was not uh, an undocumented uh, uh, illegal alien. Uh, he uh, nevertheless did not have insurance. So I understand what happens. And I voted for it because I believe it's a public safety measure. If we are going to make all Californians safe, if 1.3 million people have driver's license, maybe half of them at least will get insurance. I presented to Arnold Schwarzenegger a study by the AAA, uh, the Automobile Club, that said that uninsured motorists are five times more likely to have a serious accident. I voted, it, I voted for that bill to make California safer. I voted for that bill so that people would not have to suffer the kinds of tragedies that I know and many of you have had to suffer as well. Another question from the panel. We'll start with Mr. Villarregosa. How do we ensure LAX and the ports to remain economic engines and global gateways? By opposing the LAX expansion plan. Look, folks, um, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. LAX uh, and the, the 405, rather, and the west side are already a parking lot. To put all of our airport capacity at LAX makes no sense because there's no growth on the west side. The growth is in San Bernardino and Riverside. We own Ontario. We ought to put our infrastructure capacity there. The growth is in North County, Palmdale, uh, Santa Clarita. We ought to invest in Palmdale uh, as a very important to increasing capacity. You know, when you go into New York, Washington, D.C., or the Bay Area, you go into three airports. Why should we go into one airport here in Los Angeles? Uh, I am committed uh, as mayor of the city of Los Angeles to ensuring that the LAX proposal, the expansion proposal by Jim Hahn, will be dead on arrival. Mr. Bob Hertzberg is here with us. Thank you, sir. I'm so sorry. It took me two hours. I really apologize. Uh, the rain and the traffic was tough. And how is the traffic? 
Hmm? How is the traffic? If I have a plan to fix it, I want you to know. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. Thank you. I really apologize. Obviously, so we've, been, we've been into this discussion for almost an hour now, so I'm going to go ahead and um, I guess I, I won't call it opening no. remarks anymore, but... Uh, it's opening for uh, me. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just thank you. Thank you. Do you have one minute? Sure. Yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, these, these are tough times, in my, in my view, in the city of Los Angeles. We face pretty extraordinary challenges. Uh, our schools, 53% of ninth graders aren't graduating high school. Uh, the traffic, obviously, we just saw, I would argue, the, got, you know, the rain a little different today, but are just extraordinary and makes, a, I think, a big statement about um, the fact that uh, the leadership says that we're going to fix traffic at 25 intersections a year, and that, my judgment, is just not by orders of magnitude of what the city of Los Angeles is. And certainly, I think that we need to add police to uh, our city. Uh, we're larger than eight of the largest cities in the United States, and we're highly under-policed, and I would argue that we don't need to raise taxes to do that. Those are the three principal platforms upon which I'm running. I apologize, I don't know what else I missed, but I'm happy to add in and uh, fill in whatever questions you deem appropriate. We do have plenty of questions, sir. Uh, the first question Mr. to Mr. Hertzberg. Uh, we, yes. we talk about crime, so um, maybe it's a loaded question. How much are you acquainted with organizations like La Mara Salvatrucha, and what is your experience preventing and fighting crime? Well, my experience is, it, I'll take this up, is, is certainly not uh, great uh, in dealing directly, but uh, I'll tell you, when I was in the legislature, I was chair of the Public Safety uh, Committee, and uh, I worked very diligently in an effort to try to take a holistic approach toward dealing with crime, and particularly gang crime. And I wrote a bill uh, and started a program called the CLEAR program, which the district attorney says is the single most effective anti-gang program in the country. 39% uh, reduction in the Northeast Valley uh, and, in, and in Highland Park by virtue of the program. And what it does is, I don't know what those cards mean. That, OK. Um, <laughs> And, and what it did is it, it basically took a holistic approach toward gang uh, uh, intervention, where what we do is we take the, the, the county and probation and the po Los Angeles police and the public defender all working together to deal with the problem holistically, and it's been brilliant in terms of its effort, and I'm very proud to have authored it, and in each year in the legislature to fight for the money for Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hertzberg. This question is directly from, from, from the audience, from the students, and, uh, and also to uh, Mr. Bob Hertzberg. And we're, we're talking about it right now, traffic. What would you do to, to improve traffic as mayor? Well, the, fir the first thing that I would do on the first day in office is to stop road construction uh, during rush hour. I mean, it's just dumber than a box of rocks. Jim Hahn says he's doing it, and I ask everybody who's here, have you seen road construction during rush hour? Because the other morning, the other morning, we were at KBC, and literally five minutes, I don't know, Antonio, if you ran into it, or Richard, if you ran into it, but there were two big road construction projects at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I've seen them every single day as I'm out on the campaign trail, and I would sign an order to do that. Second, like we did during the Olympics, I would take the, the trucks off the freeway two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening in an effort to um, just fundamentally change the way traffic flows. It worked very well during the Olympics. If you go to my website, changela.com, you'll see a commuter bill of rights. You'll see that I've articulated in very direct terms what I will do to deal with the traffic situation. And I just think it really, as I started talking about in my opening, it relates fundamentally to an attitude, an attitude about how you fight for your city and you get up every single day and you figure it out and you fix it. And there's nothing more important to quality of life in the near term that a mayor needs to do but to fix traffic. Thank you, Mr. Hertzberg. This question is also from the audience and it's from Mr. Alarcón. If you give more power to the neighborhood council system, how would you balance the not in my backyard mentality that is so very present in communities so that you can move forward on much needed infrastructure? The same way I would when I developed, a, redeveloped the General Motors plant and created 4,000 jobs, I required the developers to work directly with the community, with the Homeowners Association, with the Chamber of Commerce, with the neighborhood watches that surrounded and the, the neighbors that were immediately adjacent. They came together and they worked on that project and there wasn't a single 
protest in, in the largest development in the San Fernando Valley in the last 20 years. Uh, I did the same thing with housing. When, when neighborhoods were upset about housing coming into their neighborhoods, I required the developers to work with the community. Guess what? We developed 1,200 units of housing more than any other council district during that five-year period. The mayor is bragging about three and a half or, or 3,400 units of housing in three and a half years. In just one council district out of 15, I developed 1,200 units of affordable housing. Those are the things you can do when you work with the community. I believe if you empower the neighborhood councils, if you train them about land use and planning, I believe they'll do a better job. And when I drive around some of the neighborhoods in LA, I say, what the heck, what can we lose? Because some of the neighborhoods are deteriorating rapidly. I believe the neighborhood councils are a way to make them strong, beautiful, and culturally sensitive. Thank you, Mr. Alarcón. Mr. Villarregosa, Jessica Osorio, one of the students here, wants to know, what would you do to make sure that every child in Los Angeles obtain, obtains a quality education? I'll focus uh, on an effort to address the fact that we don't have enough schools in the city. And so what the city can concretely do is help to site those schools and build the community support for them. We'll put libraries and parks by schools so that uh, we can address the fact that we have a shortage of land in this city. We'll expand after school programs. I'll stand up with everyone in this city and say, look, if you want great schools, you gotta invest in them. You can't get it on the cheap. I do believe, like Mr. Alarcon, that our teachers are the most underpaid, among the most underpaid anywhere, that we need to invest in our teachers. We need teacher training and accountability, parents and teachers making decisions at local school sites. We need smaller schools, and I support charter schools uh, in the city of Los Angeles, especially in the lowest performing areas. We need a mayor that's gonna stand up and say that education is our most important uh, challenge because to the extent that we give the people the skills that they need, they have hope and they can overcome. As mayor, I'll make it my priority. Thank you, Mr. Alarcón. Before we uh, turn it to the panelists uh, for another question for Mr. Hertzberg, there's a very valid question here. It says, why did the mayor, Mr. Hahn, didn't show up? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> Let it be me. You know, um, I think it's absolutely disrespectful that the mayor's not here today. And I can tell you that uh, the three of us, the three of us have been to most of these debates. We've been in debates in the Valley, we've been in debates throughout Los Angeles, and Mr. Hahn has been missing in action in almost every one of them. The only one he shows up is when there's a TV camera live, uh, you know, on five or whatever it is. Uh, I think we need a mayor, there's one here, but obviously this, camera and this station wasn't important enough to him, but uh, it, it was important enough to me. It was important enough to me. Look, folks, we need a full-time mayor, everyone. We need a mayor that's gonna roll up his sleeves, a mayor that's gonna, is comfortable in South Los Angeles as he is in West or East uh, or the Valley. We need a mayor that's gonna be full-time, a mayor that's gonna work as hard as first day of office all the way to the last day of office. We need a mayor that understands that a great city needs a man who can measure up to it. Uh, that's why I'm running for mayor, and I'd be honored to have your support. Francisco Pinto from Channel 34. Uh, question to Mr. Mr. Hersberg. Uh, good evening. Uh, do you think that uh, Mayor uh, Han deserves at least a little bit of credit for the creation of the after school program? Uh, do you like it? Do you like the program? And if you do, what would you do to implement it in more schools? Yeah, well, when he, yeah, yes, I think that the after school program is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And Carla Sanger, who runs it, LA's Best, is one of the, my heroes. I said so in the Business Journal, which will come uh, uh, next week. And she's fabulous, and I think it's a great program. But what I'm trying to, f to focus on is not after school, but to keep kids in school in the first place. I said in my opening that 53% of ninth graders don't graduate. This is a crisis of extraordinary proportions. The mayor talked about expanding after school to 200 schools. He's only done, I believe, 43 schools. So I'm focusing on education in the biggest way, and I think that he's really working around the edges. And secondly, I want to share with you something that I did after I left government, just very briefly, is I spent the last year and a half cobbling together with Nancy Daly Reardon a preschool system. We've got $600 million from Rob Reiner's tobacco tax in Prop 10, 
and we, ha we are providing preschool for all 153,000 four-year-olds in L.A. County to give them a head start so that you really be able to help build the education system from the beginning. So I'm excited to be a part of that, and at the core of my, of my platform is to break up the LAUSD to make the schools work again. Thank you, Mr. Hertzberg. Another question from the students, Mr. Alarcón. What does leadership, leadership means to you, and what are the three most important elements of a leader in Los Angeles? First of all, I want to clear the record. Mayor Hunt did not create LA's Best. It was created by Mayor Bradley, and I know because I was one of the five staff people that came up with the idea. So let's give credit where credit is due. I, we applauded for expanding the program. As mayor, I will put it in every school as a legacy to Mayor Bradley. Uh, he created that program. Let's give credit where credit is due. What was the question? <laughs> that one upsets me. <laughs> oh, leadership. Leadership starts with integrity. Um, and we are failing on that score. Leadership starts with participation. Uh, that means going to meetings, not just coming to forums that are political debates. Why not showing up in the community when you're dealing with LAX's master plan? Why not showing up to the neighborhood councils all over the city instead of just waiting till you can pile everybody into the convention center? Why not being in, in, in the local communities and understanding and feeling what the city, what is going on in the city? Why not engaging in the discussion about violence in our community, but in the community, not just from the pu bully pulpit at City Hall? The mayor must have integrity. Uh, the mayor must be a participatory mayor, must be participating with the community. The mayor must be an activist, must be passionate about this city. The mayor must be a vanguard. This is Los Angeles. Let's make it exciting. Let's, let's make it the model for the nation that it should be with all the diverse capability that we have. Thank you, Mr. Alarcón. Before we go to closing remarks, and we'll begin with Mr. Villarraigosa, let me ask one more question to Mr. Hertzberg. And that is, Los Angeles is a very diverse community, as we all know. And Latinos are now a majority and a significant percentage speak only Spanish as their primary language. As mayor, what will be your strategy to address the specific political, cultural, and linguistic needs of the Latino community, sir? Let me start with who I am. And there's some people in this audience who've known me for more than 30 years of, as an activist in the Latino community. Someone who at the core of who I am, long before I ever ran for office, long before I ever engaged in, in any kind of politics, to really help and really be involved in the community. I was the treasurer of Mr. Villaragosa's campaign when he first ran for the assembly. I've been involved and I'm on the board of MALDEF. It is at the core of who I am and what I'm about. And so I think it starts with leadership at the top that who fundamentally understand and are engaged in the community. And so what you're going to see me do at every step of the way is to engage the community. I'm here tonight. I'm deeply apologetic for being so late. I didn't anticipate it would take me two hours to be here. I will always show respect. I will, I will do everything I can to advance the agenda. I've done it my entire life in everything I'm about. My building bridges and communities wasn't when I was running for office. It was when I started when I was 18 years old, and it's been everything I'm about. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Closing remarks, and we'll begin with Mr. Antonio Villarregos, sir. Father Lawton, I want to thank you for inviting us today. You mentioned um, Aristotle and Pericles, and I'll add to that Robespierre and Voltaire, Madison and Jefferson. Uh, our democracy is important, everyone. It's alive. Uh, it's about participation. Uh, I remember sitting with my mother, uh, watching John F. Kennedy say to the country and the world, ask not what the country can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country. I would submit to you this election is important because the city is important. You need to not just look at all of us and what we have to offer. You need to look within yourself and what you're ready to do. A mayor is someone who's a leader, but a leader can't be alone. A leader has to be able to inspire us. A leader has to be able to lead by example. A leader has to be able to engage us to make a difference. What I love about young people is that they still believe that they could change the world. I'm 52 years old, I'm a grandfather. I've got a 29-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old daughter, but I'll tell you something. I believe that one person can make a difference. I believe that together we can make a better city. That's why I'm running for mayor. I believe in Los Angeles, and I believe in you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Mr. Villarregosa. Mr. Richard Alarcón, Senator Alarcón. We do need to change Los Angeles, but it's not just about changing the mayor. It's about changing the process of decision making, giving the power to the people of Los Angeles. The neighborhoods need to be strong, but they don't have the power to change their community. Powerful development and contractor interests are stealing the decisions from the, the communities. That's why they're giving millions and millions of dollars, because they expect favor. That's why when I ask developers, can you, can you give me a campaign contribution? They say, well, no, I have a project that's being considered by the city council and the mayor, and I don't want to give. People, they believe that there's pay to play. The city of Los Angeles needs to believe it too. We need to clean up the city government. And it begins by changing the rules. That's why I provided a ballot measure to eliminate contractor and developer contributions from City Hall. That's why I'm the only candidate who wants to empower neighborhood councils with, by quadrupling their budget and providing them real planning authority to work with the other community organizations in their neighborhood and fix their neighborhoods, but make them culturally sensitive as well. We can change Los Angeles, but not just by changing the name at the door. Think of who's giving to who and who is going to really change this city and who has the least interest that they are expecting favors from City Hall. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. We all know that Los Angeles is one of the greatest cities on the planet. City of creativity and imagination, innovation. It's not happening. Jim Hahn has taken us in a direction where he's a transactional politician, isn't really providing a vision for what the new neighborhood should look like in the city of Los Angeles, and isn't, in my judgment, putting together the coalition necessary to compete regionally as the world is changing dramatically. I'm running for mayor of Los Angeles to make LA work again. And I don't f define success as getting elected on election day. I define success by doing the work. That's what I've always done. My name ID at the beginning of this election was low. It was low because I never ran for the cameras to go and call press conferences and take credit for everything. I just did the work. I'm the guy who wrote the bill for the $25 billion of new school construction that we're talking about. I just never held a press conference about it. I'm the guy who was working on the water systems and all the other things that are fundamental to the future of Los Angeles. I just never called press conferences about it. I define success as doing the job. I want to make LA work again. Thank you very much. At this moment, we would like to thank Mr. Antonio Villarregosa, Mr. Robert Hertzberg, Councilman Bernard Parks as well, and Senator Richard Alarcón. Thank you very much for participating. We would also like to thank Gabriel Lerner from La Opinión and Francisco Pinto from Noticias Univision 34. And especially Loyola Marymount University.